for tuning in to another fun episode with your favorite Mouska moms. Jennifer, that's me. Hello, Lori. Hi, guys. And Juliana. Hello. We are so super excited for today's episode. We are joined by a incredible fun guest. Um, we're going to put all of his information in the show notes, so don't worry about that just yet. But uh, I want to bring on and introduce our guest today. His name is Brian Vogt Weiss. He is an entertainment powerhouse. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Nacelle Company, which is a media company known for leading the charge in pop culture and the documentary space. Um, he is a director, executive producer. He created, directed, produced some of the greatest Netflix shows that we have all been binge watching during quarantine or what is it in Paris? Confinement. Confinement. <laughs> <laughs> These include one of my favorites that I actually watched with my 19 year old down to earth with Zac Efron. Love him. Love this show. The Movies That Made Us, The Toys That Made Us, which was a huge hit with my husband. <laughs> um, the list goes on and on. But for today, we are super excited to talk to him as it relates to the Mouska Moms. We were so excited to see his name and signature style of the documentary on uh, the Disney Plus series behind the attraction. So we are humbled to have him here with us. Let's bring him onto the show um brian welcome hi hello thank you for thank having you. me thank welcome. you for being here with us yes this is awesome so we can't wait to talk with you but of for but of course first we always do a little ritual with our guests um and we ask them to share their favorite disney cocktail or as we say it a mouska cocktail so what do you have for us well by, by complete coincidence my favorite Disney character uh, is also my favorite drink. And if I had to guess, it's probably not a coincidence. Uh, but Donald Duck from day one has been my favorite character. And I love, uh, I call it the Donald Duck drink. So whenever I order it, I'm always like, can I get the Donald Duck thing with alcohol? And they know <laughs> what I mean. Um, and it, I, it, my favorite fruit is apricots. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a fun fact. Until I knew that I was going to be asked about this, I never actually knew what was in the drink. I just knew that I liked it. So I Googled, <laughs> it. I Googled it and I was like, oh, yeah, that's why I like it. It's apricots. And there's all these fancy French things in it, like blah, 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 de coco or something. Uh, but, <laughs> See, that's how I say it. <laughs> but yeah, so, but I'm going I'm to stick with the apricots because I can pronounce that word. <laughs> That's perfect. I mean, you need a drink that you can pronounce. So, so it's it's Cointreau, which is orange, apricot brandy, and the French thing that you said, creme de cacao or whatever. It's which is yeah, chocolate, yeah. right? Yeah. So is this a very sweet drink? Yes, it's extremely sweet. Mm. That's what I like. Like when I was in okay. college, I was the guy at the bar drinking Zima, and all the other dudes were making <laughs> fun of. The women were probably making fun of me too. They were just doing it behind my back. But <laughs> yes, I like I like the sweet drinks. That's that's my thing. I mean, I'm, the sweet drink Zima that cracks me up. Talk right. about nostalgia, which is like your <laughs> shtick. So there Zima. You go. Zima, I was gonna say this drink sounds awesome to me. So it's apricots, chocolate, sweet. I'm I'm good. Well, you're all about the sweet stuff all I the know, time. This, Juliana this and I are like. I it, think it, it needs me. bourbon. <laughs> I think it's rum. I think it's rum. And rum is my favorite. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's rum. Is it rum? I don't know. It doesn't don't say that there's, there's rum in there. there. No, rum it has my favorite it says, alcohol. Other than say, it, says, it says brandy, but I think apricot brandy would be, it would taste so sweet. It would taste more rum than it would the other. Thank you for know. covering for me, Lori. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Good thing. Good thing. I don't you know. Don't, we don't do that often. So no. no. <laughs> apricot, <laughs> brandy, apricot brandy reminds me of peach schnapps, which I had bad experience. Uh, no, it with doesn't. That. Peach schnapps is a whole different ballgame. I would love to try it. I just want to add bourbon to it. I think it sounds good. <laughs> let me let me know. That it, it, it can't be made worse. So it, 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 it sounds only, good. It can only be improved. And I'm yeah. wondering why it's Donald Duck. Like, does Donald Duck drink brandy? That's very odd. I don't mean to give away any of the, the magic, but if I had to guess, there was a bartender giving a bunch of names 
And it was just kind of like, here's the drink, here's the name, here's the Sounds good. <laughs> so where were you first served the Donald Duck? I could be wrong, but I'm 99.999% sure it was Disney World. Oh. Yeah. And because, when was, this, was this Club 33? No, this was <laughs> long, long, I mean, a decade and a half before I ever stepped foot in a Club 33. But uh, no, I, I, and the reason I'm pretty sure it's Disney World is um, I never drank alcohol in Disneyland until I was out of college. So, or I mean, long out of college. So I remember the first time ever drinking at a park was Disney World. Hmm. Well, I we have to, we'll have to make it our mission to bring it back. It's going to make a comeback. We're all going to go order the Donald Duck next time we're there. And we'll yes. see. We'll see how it goes. We'll report back. Bring it back. <laughs> Add the brandy. Yes. So back to you now that we've talked about, now that you've passed the cocktail test. It so, is. um, so I know that at your company, can you say the name for me again? Cause I don't want to mess it up. Well, ironically, apropos what we were just talking about, it's a French word, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's the nacelle company. Okay. So the nacelle company, you've had your hands in all kinds of pots and genres from comedy to docu-series. So what got you into the, the docu-series sort of line of work that you've been doing lately? Well, we've been doing docu-series for a long time. Huh? Uh, but if there's like a BCAD moment uh, of our filmmaking, it would be Toys That Made Us. So Toys That Made Us, which took me about seven years to sell, that was the first series that, well, there were two things about it that made it special. One was it was the first thing I ever sold that was based on like a hobby. So mm -hmm. It, everything I had done before that was like I would do market research and then bring to the market what they wanted and sell it and do my best, but it wasn't a passion project. So that was the first thing. The second thing was it's the first show we ever did other than stand-up comedy. It's the first show we ever did for Netflix. And Netflix is the first place where I ever worked where they uh, – I'm trying to say this in a way that doesn't offend anybody else, but they they really just kind of let me do whatever I wanted. And they were like, they definitely gave notes. They definitely gave guidance. But whereas other networks at the time may have said, we hear you, but shut up and do what we want. Netflix would say, we hear you. We don't agree with you, but if Go you're ahead. right, you'll get a second season. If you're wrong, you won't. Interesting. And they That's really, really interesting. left it up to me to just, and usually what I would do when that would happen, which was not very often. I mean, I probably, I would say in the first eight episodes of Toys That Made Us, that issue happened maybe three times. Two of the times I just did what they wanted. They were right. And one of the times I drastically changed what I had wanted to do to bring into account their opinion on that topic. And I think that was the right choice. But either way, they just trusted me and it apparently the public liked it. That's awesome. Sounds like you trusted them too. So you've been doing this obviously for a while, but was Toys That Made Us just immediately successful? I mean, it, it really it really was. It, and it by was the way, so I, would also, I would also add an immediacy that only Netflix at the time you know, Toys That Made Us came out almost five years ago, season one. And at the time, like even, I am 99.9% .9 sure we are in the first five unscripted original green lights in Netflix history. So wow. they were also trying to like figure out what they were doing and how they were doing it. So that was a big part of why we, um, sorry, uh, that, I just lost half my, uh, Half my computers just died. Oh, sorry. oh no. Um, but um, but that being said, that that's what caused it, I think, to change was Netflix being Netflix. And I mean, we had about 200 reviews within like the first week. One was bad. And I, my career up until that point, and I'm not trying to be funny, really was the opposite of that. So like for every hundred reviews, like 98 would be bad, two would be okay. And like toys was the beginning of that change. 
That's so great. And I'm sure like, I mean, I kind of said it tongue in cheek in the beginning of the podcast, but like, um, I'm sure you're gaining audiences every day. I mean, I feel like the quarantine was all about binge watching stuff on Netflix and everybody was talking about, all right, what are you watching? I mean, what did I start off with? The tiger, that tiger mess. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and then after that, it was like, well, what are you watching now? And what are you watching next? And it was documentaries, which I just don't feel like that's ever happened before and so like that's where I started watching your stuff and you know we were just dying for new information and new things and new things to watch and talk about because we didn't have the water cooler chatter anymore so right so um, so like I mentioned earlier we're, we were super excited to see your style and what you do come to Disney plus with behind the attraction um but like, dealing with Disney things and taking because you've been a lifelong Disney fan and taking things that you've been passionate about and turning them into what works for you with Netflix and Disney plus you have a lot of um dealing with nostalgia is presents its own challenges because you've got some diehard fans you want to represent everything well what was that like did you did you feel that sort of pressure to represent what you were i i did but to be completely honest with you the pressure i felt came from not wanting to let disney down yeah. um Listen, I've been dealing with the public for my whole career. I, I mean, I even in, co I, you know, I worked at Subway in college. Like, I know the public. And what I know about the public is you do the best you can and you hope they dig it. Like, there's it within reason. I just got every director has to be true to their heart. And you just got to pray to God your heart is in sync with the population. And it is or it isn't. Like, it's that simple. But on the other hand, the Disney company, I mean, the, the the amount of trust they gave us, I mean, the trust was nuts. Like, the tr I mean, the, the best way to describe it was frequently when we were meeting people for the first time, like, we would, you know, we had a Disney representative with us all the time. So if we went to a, a lab or we went to this or we went to that, there was always someone from Imagineering with us. And basically we would go in somewhere and they would be like, uh, and the Disney person would, the Imagineer would have to be like, it's cool. And then the person would be like, okay. And they would literally show us stuff. I exaggerate not that like the public will not be aware of until like the early 2030s. Like, so are you allowed to talk about any of it? <laughs> <laughs> I, the only, here's the, there's two things, luckily, I can talk about to make you understand my point, because Disney has already made them public, but 90% of what we saw is not public. But two examples I can give you, the robot that could jump, that's now Spider-Man, oh we saw that with no costume in our uh. warehouse while it was being tested. We, I was with, you know, the crew, Rob and Henry, like we were like all that, whatever. We leave, we just stood outside looking at each other for about 30 seconds without talking. Like it was nuts. And the other thing we were aware of was those lightsabers that like are a hilt and then become a lightsaber. So we had seen that. We had seen both of those things in like the end phase of the prototype phase. So imagine what I'm not telling you. I oh can't. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. I, I don't even want I don't even want to know. I'm I'm even... awestruck right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I right? Really the other thing I'll tell you, and I, I never know if people like this or it annoys them, but we did this thing. Do you guys know what a third shift tour is? No. No. So that's uh, it's where they let you be in the park from 9 p.m. until 5 a.m. How does and one get one of these tours? <laughs> you have to be, special. <laughs> you have to be Brian. <laughs> they will show to Disney Plus. It's very helpful. <laughs> uh, it's, it's probably the third or fourth greatest thing that's happened to me in my entire career. Like wow. I mean, it was bonkers. But I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you two things from that. The first is I. I assumed 
for weeks ahead of time. I was like, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. I've never been to a park and no one's in it. Like we're going to have the park to ourselves. Da, da, da. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of employees there. Like the, the thing I'll tell you, and I never like, I hope Disney doesn't mind me saying this. We were there the first week of August at like two in the morning in the first week of August, we saw a full stack, full dressed everything rehearsal of the Thanksgiving Day Parade. <laughs> like that's the kind of stuff we saw. And then the other thing, and again, this is the part where I'm like, I hope this doesn't annoy you. Cause like sometimes it's annoying to be told things that it's like not really telling you what I'm telling you, but <laughs> let me tell you this. On one of the newer attractions, I'll leave it vague. Um, I mean, very new, like less than two years old. There is something that on the most conservative analysis I can do cost 15 to $20 million. You have no idea it's there. You have no idea it's going on. You have no idea it exists. But if it didn't, what would have been an hour line? What is an hour line at worst? Probably would have been a four to six hour line. And you have, I had done that attraction conservatively five or six times. No idea. Like, this is a Disney no land. Idea. It's at Disneyland. It's at a bunch of the parks now. Um, but it's like I said, it's a much, it's a very new attraction. So my whole point in telling the story is, because I don't know how you are with this, but one of the things that frustrates me is when people are criticizing Disney's prices. And after I finished that uh, third shift tour, I was like, I don't know how this company makes a profit. <laughs> like, I mean, it was literally like, we, one thing I can tell you, we were on one of the attractions. Again, this is at two or three in the morning. There were 11 full-time cast members. All they do for their line of work every year is make sure this one attraction is safe for the following day. They don't work. It's not like they go attraction to attraction all night long. Every attraction has its own team. That was the only one I saw. So for all I know, they're bigger or smaller elsewhere. This one attraction had 11 full-time employees. All they do is make sure it's safe. So when you see the ticket price, that's what you don't understand. Like you're paying for stuff you don't see as much as you are for what you do see. I think that's a really great point. And we do, we talk about that a lot too. And, and when you put it that way, you think about like all these people coming into the gates every day, how many of those people are paying just for those 11 people, their salary for the year. Yeah. And I think a, to some extent, I think behind the attractions has kind of opened our eyes to some of this in terms of maybe not the well no even the technology behind this stuff but the thought and the history and all the things that we don't think about because when we're there in the moment we're, we just want a great ride but there really is so much more to it and i think that that's a huge thing that that your show has brought to life not just for people who experience disney every once in a while but for like super fans who go all the time and think about it all the time and talk about it all the time and you know we all th thought we were experts and we knew <laughs> we knew everything and then i learned something new every single time i turn on turn on that show yeah. So it's, that's what we tried to do. So thank you. I'm, I'm happy you felt that way. It, it's, it's great. Super fan, super fan. <laughs> what was it like for you then, Brian, uh, pulling back the curtain in the way that you did? I mean, obviously the curtain was pulled back for you far more than, than you're able to share with the rest of us, but was it other than, than justifying ticket prices in your mind? Was it, did it, does it ruin the magic? Does it make the magic all that more impressive? Is it something, you know, tell, what does that feel like? It, it, listen, I think if I was six years old, it would have like, maybe ruined the magic. I don't know. 
all it did for me was, because again, I, I, even at six years old, I have to think, like my daughter's seven, my son is six. Like, they know. Like, <laughs> like, like when my, one of my favorite moments of my entire life was I was with my daughter when she was two and a half to three and we're watching the parade. By the way, the first time I ever watched the parade, because I'm not a parade guy. So I'm sitting there watching the parade and I'm looking that way. And all of a sudden I hear my dad, my daughter, like, daddy, daddy, like, like someone was like sticking her with like a, a needle. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> and she's like, daddy, Donald, Donald. Like, could not believe that like, and she even kind of said it like, I can't believe Donald Duck could be anywhere in the world, but he happens to be right where I'm standing. By four years old, she would not have that point of view. Like, it, I mean, so my whole point is, here's another way to say it. I'm sorry I'm jumping around. When the show was greenlit, I truly in my heart, I thought I had a PhD in Disney. I would say with a, basically Disney realized after the show was greenlit, by the way, every single day making the show, I said to myself at least once, I cannot believe this show was greenlit. And it's a, a part of that, I mean, th there was like no plan. It was like, congratulations, go make a show. Because don't forget, we were hired by Disney Plus, but we had to work with the Imagineers and the Yellow Shoes and the parks. So it became very apparent after a week or two that we kind of needed like unofficial Disney training to understand, to be blunt, what the hell we were talking about. Yeah. So they organized this kind of unofficial training period where, and that included the, uh, the third shift tour that allowed us to get the access and the understanding. By the time I finished that, which like I said, was about a month, I was like, oh, I don't have a PhD in Disney. I think <laughs> I have a fourth grade degree in Disney. Like, wow. yeah, we didn't get it. And I remember the moment it became apparent to me, we were, we were in a conference room with Dave Durham, one of the Imagineers, He's in the show quite a bit. Yep. And Dave Durham was like say, talking about something. And then he was like, da, 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 da. And then he's like, well, you have to understand when we dig a hole at Disneyland to like start building what will become Galaxy's Edge, the same day we're digging that hole, we're going deeper in the ground than we need to and we're putting in the plumbing and wires for attractions that will be built 15 years from now. And I just remember hearing him say that and I'm like, oh. It's, that's it, it's really funny because when we get pieces of news that Disney's about to build something because they filed a permit, we all think we're getting like this breaking news and we have to break it first, but it's been in the work for 20 Forever. years. Forever. When they broke ground for Batu in Anaheim, they were literally laying the infrastructure, and I, I couldn't even tell you what it is, but they were laying the infrastructure for a construction. For the next thing. Not, I'm not telling you when it's gonna open, I'm telling yeah. you when they're gonna start working on it. And this was in 2019. The construction of whatever it's gonna be is starting in 2028. Oh Jesus. So they're literally putting stuff down there for 10 years later. In the same meeting, he told me this. And again, this was the stuff I heard where it just allowed me to start. So what if you like the show, this was the information that I got that helped me. It's what I call finding the spinal column. I'm always like, what's the spinal column? What's the spinal column of the series? What's the spinal column of every episode? And these conversations with Dave Durham built the spinal calm. He was like, he was talking about the redo of the 20,000 Leagues of the Sea attraction, how it was turned into the Finding Nemo attraction. And he was talking about how in the portholes, 
the way that effect works, there's a projector beaming the effect into the porthole. Mm-hmm. Well, he said, when you build an attraction, you have to hope it's going to last 15 years at a minimum. How many projectors do you know that are on sale for 15 years? Yeah, None. No. He's like, they're constantly redoing them. And at some point, they'll stop making them all together. So when we do an attraction, we got to buy extra projectors. We got to buy extra light bulbs because the light bulbs that the projectors use could be leaving sir like and again i'm listening to all of this in a disney headquarters conference room and i'm like that's what i want people to understand when they watch the show yeah. that it's what you see as much as what you don't see that makes the magic so back to your question um all it did was make me I mean, I feel like I went from being kind of a normal Disney fan to like becoming a lunatic Disney fan. <laughs> There's no I, such I, thing. Welcome to the club. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what I qualify as a, a lunatic fan. I have been going to Anaheim since I was five years old. My grandparents lived out here, all that stuff. About a month ago, I was going to the park with my wife to see a, a, a movie that was premiering there. And we're walking through the parking lot, a parking lot I have walked through conservatively 10 dozen times, maybe 20 dozen times. I mean, I have been there at least twice a year, probably other than college my whole life. And then while making the show, I think we were there 89,000 times. So I have walked through that parking lot a trillion times. <laughs> we're walking through the parking lot and my wife says to me, are you? Are you crying? <laughs> I've seen the top of Space Mountain. That's fuck. That, sorry, I assume I can't curse. No, that, that's, it. <laughs> that's it. All I saw was like the top three percent of Space Mountain, but I hadn't seen it in a year and a half because of COVID. And I literally, I wasn't crying. But I was definitely you were crying. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) My wife has absolutely seen me cry a billion times. So I I will say it was tearing up. Jen Jen sobbed the last time she saw Happily Ever After. But again, half of it was because I loved the show, and the other half was, oh my god, this is such a sense of normalcy returning that we're having fireworks in Disney World. Like, yay, hallelujah! And then you know, Delta variant and. <laughs> but uh in the same movie I'm in. Like what? You, you you and I are in the same movie. Yes, we're in the same movie. And yeah, and I think that's fine. Yeah. And, and I think that's fine. And I heard you say on another interview, I heard you talking about that spinal column, and it was so interesting to me. And you were talking about particularly your It's a Small World episode and the French girl singing well, that, it's that broke, I have to that, say that broke, that broke the whole show oh my god and now every time i watch it again i'm thinking in my mind i have your voice in my mind talking about the meaning behind it and how sent and as if it wasn't sentimental enough already and yes ladies i am sentimental and i cry yes you are i just i can't (laughs) watch that anymore and the same thing i watched it again last night i'm like guys you have to see this and i made my kids come in i'm like just watch this and they're looking at me (laughs) like i'm insane but it's so true. And I think that that's the beauty. And that's like, that's the success of all these shows that you've done. Like you hit this nerve in us with, I think, I think it's the nostalgia. I mean, I loved the Zac Efron series. I thought it was so cool. It was a cool thing for me to relate to my kid who's so into the environment and engineering and all that. But on a whole other level, the movies that made us, the toys that made us behind the attractions, it's that nostalgia and that like, especially in this time of COVID and things with the world not being all right, I think that's exactly what we need. And I think that's why this in particular is resonating with so many people. And it's such like a, 
it's interesting and it's, you know, let's let's look at this ride that we think we're experts in. Action, Jennifer. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. You're right. Oh, You're right. <laughs> words are important. Speaking of words <laughs> and titles. I guess what the <laughs> speaking of titles being important, before we let you go, Brian, I have one thing that I wanted to get to the bottom of, and I didn't yeah. know if you could help me. Well, first of all, have you met the Bobs? We refer to them as the Bobs, Bob Chapek and, and the other Bob, Iger. Bob Iger. <laughs> Iger. I have met Iger. I have not met Chapek. So we're just wondering because we actually on our podcast have a series called Behind the Attraction. And uh -oh. we are convinced that Bob and Bob listened to us. So I just was wondering whose idea <laughs> it was and maybe, you know, uh, if we really were that influential in the Disney world, that's all. That's a great question. Uh, this is, no one's asked that before. <laughs> so the way the show came about was the week after Toys That Made Us came out, I'm at the airport at five in the morning. And I mean, literally out of a movie, as I'm putting my phone into the tray to go through security, through the x-ray, I get a text from the head of our, mind you, it's five in the morning. I get a text from the head of our accounting department, Daisy, but I, I can't, I, I'm putting, so literally for two minutes, I'm like, why is the head of accounting text? She never texts me ever. <laughs> why is she texting me? At, like does someone take all our money? Like this is bad. Did we miscalculate something? I get my phone and she had texted me uh, a screenshot of The Rock's Instagram. So I guess she didn't think I was cool and followed him myself, but it was a picture <laughs> of him watching toys that made us on his private jet. Uh, about three days later, approximately, I get a call from his company. And at that time, like, I don't even know if I would have taken the call. I would have thought it was a prank. I took the call. Long story short, he loved the show. It wasn't him. It was someone at his company. Um, we got in business and um, we pitched a show that had absolutely, positively nothing to do with the parks and nothing to do with Disney. And <laughs> the guy we pitched, a guy named Dan Silver, uh, called me later and was like, hey, man, uh, good news, bad news. The bad news? <laughs> We don't want that show. We don't like that show. The good news, believe it or not, we like The Rock. Uh, and we also love you. So would you consider doing a show about the parks and the, wait, don't jump on me, the rides? So we pitched them a show. I We have a deck, everything, that was called Behind the Rides. And... The, the show basically was almost greenlit as behind the rides. Are you familiar with yellow shoes? Mm -mm. You know yellow shoes are yellow shoes is the division at Disney that basically films everything that is filmed in the parks. Okay. So they in the greatest, nicest way, because I know this word can come off as derogatory. I mean, this is the greatest compliment in the world. They chaperoned us everywhere we went. And it was the head of the Yellow Shoes, Sally Connor, who, by the way, she's one of like five people that after Disney Plus said they wanted to do the show, five other departments had to sign off on the green light. She was one of them. And it literally at the end of the meeting that was make or break for the show, she was like, oh, and just a tip, we don't call them rides. And that <laughs> is how the show became known as Behind the Attraction. So what you're saying is that not only are Bob Chapek and Bob, Bob Iger super fans of our podcast, but so is Dwayne The Rock Johnson and The Yellow Shoes. When, they... I, met, when I met <laughs> Iger, Dwayne was with me. And the only thing the three of us talked about the whole time after we were done with the hellos was your podcast. Yes. Uh, you're you're I'm... actually... I'm not surprised. I'm going to get sued now, but I have to be honest with you. <laughs> Thank you. It's, 
Thank you. Thank you for confirming. You actually talked about stealing your title. So let's not call attention to that, Brian. This is admissible if, if I understand the way the law works. <laughs> that well, thank fantastic. you so much for being here. Thank you. This was fun. Yes, hey, thank you. Thank you. We definitely appreciate it. And everybody, go ahead and watch everything that Brian has ever done. That's it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and everything that's to come. We didn't even get to talk about we didn't what's even get coming. To talk about that. Do you want to? Do you want to throw us a bone and tell us what we have on the horizon? Are there more episodes? I know a bunch just released. We have not been told if we're not going to know for at least a month if we're making more. They need time to look at the data. The one thing I will say to everybody listening, and if you can help us with this, this is. I mean, this is really, really, all jokes aside, very important to get more episodes. These streaming companies, the thing, Netflix, Apple Plus, Disney Plus, the most important variable that they care about as it relates to how they judge a show's success or not is what they call completion rate. Mm -hmm. So if anybody out there wants more episodes, but you only watch the attractions you're interested in. That is in some ways worse for us than if you hadn't watched the show at all. Interesting. So I would ask you, if you care about the show, watch the episodes you haven't watched because that is absolutely positively the good news or the bad news as it relates to when I get the phone call telling me if we're making more or not. So- Please oh, watch every episode. Well, okay, so I, on every TV I was going to say, house. so I got to go back and watch the Hall of Presidents. <laughs> but, but Lori, Lori, <laughs> I will tell you this, and I probably shouldn't say this. Uh, it's probably the episode I was the least excited to make. <laughs> I, I went it, through the list. I loved them, and that was the one I was like, mm. but, but, I will, but But I will tell you this. I'm proud of that episode. It's actually extremely interesting compared to what I thought. And by the way, same thing happened to me on Toys That Made Us. I had zero interest in He-Man. I didn't <laughs> want to make He-Man whatsoever. The crew practically revolted. And I basically <laughs> backed off and said, fine, fine, we'll do He-Man. Uh, it's considered our best episode. I think it's why, uh, I think it's a big part of why we got our green light for at least the second season. Like, so yes, but to, your, to my point, Lori, that, absolutely hurts us because, and I'm not talking about you in that episode. Yes, you yes. are. It's all her fault. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't get another season, it's your fault. My fault. All hey, right. I'm watching it like right now. <laughs> and I do Instagram. Where are you? Where are you? Are you in Naperville? Where are you right now, Lori? I'm in Sh Chicago. I'm in Barrington, South or Northwest suburbs. But aren't you impressed? I got, I knew you were a I suburb. Know, look at that. You did. <laughs> And you're not French, Juliana, but you're you're in France. You know French people. There's someone. Uh, French people. You're very sweet. I you. Wow, I'm impressed. No, I lived in France for a couple of years, but I'm back in well, Charlotte now. Lori, Lori is real. You, I cheated on. I heard you talking about France. Mm -hmm. uh, Lori, Lori, Lori. I, I can tell Chicago with with my eyes closed. Then, <laughs> yes, watch that episode, Lori. Whatever you skip, right. go back and watch it. Okay, we'll do. Homework. And everybody else oh, should too. So I'm not just asking people for favors. I will say this, and this is not BS. This is true. You will enjoy the rest of the season more. When we did season one of Toys, I cannot tell you for the first three or four months, we would be getting hundreds of messages every day. I watched every episode. This is the greatest show ever. I mean, mind you, not Barbie. Every I loved episode, that episode. Every episode. Every message practically said that. About months later, we started getting messages that said, I love this show so much. I've seen it a billion times. I went back and I said, Oh, I love this show so much. I'm gonna watch the Barbie episode. It's the best episode. It was so good. If you watch the Barbie episode, you'll like the G.I. Joe episode even more. You'll like the He-Man episode even more. So don't watch Hall of Presidents for me, Lori. Watch okay. it for you. Okay. For you. Small world, small. You'll like. I'll tell you right now. You'll like Small World more. 
and you'll like the Star Wars episode more. Oh. And we'll mention maybe others. But a lot of what we talk about in the Hall of Presidents applies to other episodes. Okay. All right. I've been convinced. That is good. Yes, <laughs> And on that note, I mean, what more can we say? Everybody go watch everything he's done and watch it all beginning to yes. end. Yeah, watch it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. It was lovely chatting with you. And thank you. It was a lot of fun. Go yes, enjoy your you. California sunshine. Yeah, will do. Think of me when it's 110 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you. All right. Thank you. See ya.